Drop me in for the gap. I didn't have any expectations and I just started just let it see what see what happened with it. So we started off in really small clubs and then it got bigger and bigger and bigger and ended up in arenas, you know. The tour was one of the longest tours I ever did. It was 15 months. There were great nights every night and I guess it's because I don't know whether the crowd had any expectations or I didn't have any expectations. It just happened and then when it finished I was like, fucking hell, you know. I thought I'd kind of tolerate it, being centre stage and being a singer every night. As it got further on, I really enjoyed it. With previous tours in Oasis, let's say, there would always be so much chaos and just bullshit surrounding it that it would be great to get away and just get back home and shut the front door and just forget about it. There's just something in me now feels different than what it did then. I had about six months off, which is something I probably won't do again. I got bored really, really quickly. Going in the studio on my own is a far more pleasurable experience than going in the studio with five, six, you know, seven other people who are all songwriters and all have a democratic and legitimate say about how things are going to be. That in itself creates, you know, lots of problems and all that. But when you, when you do it on, on your own, you're doing it on your own terms and at, and at your own leisure and your own pace. And it's, it's a lot more enjoyable. I, think. I started by going in and recording the songs that were left over and old songs that have been hanging around for a while, songs from the last sessions that were kind of left over and old stuff that back from Oasis days that I never got around to recording. Because I run my own record label and I do everything and I, I make the record myself and all that, it, there's not really a definite starting point. Again, I don't want to keep going back to Oasis days, but that's all I've got to kind of compare it against. But back then, it, you know, you would get an email of someone saying the studio's booked from here to here and this is when we're going to go and do it and we'll kind of see you there, you know. Uh, it's not like that now, it's kind of, I kind of make all the decisions and kind of fall into it. The start of it was, it was a pain in the ass. We started just doing demos, you know. He went away to see his friends in America to see if he would redo them maybe fix them up and improve and perfect maybe a bit more. I went to LA, which is where I've recorded my last four or five records. And Dave Sardi, who produced the last record, he didn't want to do it. And he it was a kind of a bit of a shocker, really. Played him the stuff and he was like, mm -hmm, you yeah. know. And I remember coming out of a meeting and saying to my manager, I'm not really sure he was into that. A month later, he said he didn't want to do it. So I was looking around for a producer for what seemed like a lifetime. I've seen a few people and they didn't want to do it either. <laughs> but it was a bit of a kind of wake up call. I'm thinking, fucking hell, you know, I'm going to have to do it on my own, you know, which I've never done before, and which has turned out to be a major pain in the ass. <laughs> I've got a great engineer in my old mate, uh, Paul Stacey, who plays bass on a lot of the records. I started working with Noel in 97, with Oasis in fact. I auditioned as a keyboard player, because I didn't have any work as a guitar player. To my surprise, it worked. I went to the audition and in five minutes he said, you'll do. He plays keyboards and guitar, we kind of, so me and him and his twin brother, who's my drummer Jeremy, effectively made the record between the three of us. <laughs> I've met him before because obviously my twin brother played with Oasis and worked with him. He'd come and seen a couple of gigs with my brother and I. I think that's when he worked out that he might be interested in me playing drums for him. I'm very lucky to have those two because they're great musicians and they've got a great knowledge of music and all kinds of different music. And I can talk to them in a very rudimentary way about what I wanted 
and they, and they got it. Well, we seem to have a good musical connection. He is actually quite specific. It's actually quite easy for me because I get a very clear picture from him of what he wants on the drums. But then obviously I've got to be able to, to interpret that. He has, you know, at times also not been sure exactly what he wants or he's said something and hasn't quite worked and then he's let me try something. So yeah, it's very easy. I think we work very comfortably together and uh, it's always good fun, but we get the job done very quickly. <laughs> Producing your own albums, you know, nobody tells me what to write anyway or what direction it should be going in or any of that. What I found difficult was actually managing the sessions from one end of the week to the other. You know, sometimes you'd start on a Monday morning and get to Friday and you'd, I'd be going home on the tube or something and thinking, what have I actually done this week? I couldn't keep up with it all. Whereas producers, they have a system, they know how to manage sessions and session musicians and backing singers and this person's coming in that day and that person's coming in this day and I found that difficult and a waste of energy. I'm not used to people kind of looking to me and saying, right, so what are we doing today? I wouldn't recommend it, but it's a fucking pain in the arse. This one was more relaxed in the sense of that I think we didn't try to perfect things so much. You know, most records nowadays, everything's airbrushed, you know, it's just the way of the world. And perfect records, is, that's not what music's about to me. This one has got a bit more soul and life in it because we didn't go that route. The recording process, um, working with Noel, and with Paul Stacey was very interesting. It's, it was very funny, very organic, very cool and just, you know, I, I like to take, get, um, taking direction from Noel because he's um, an artist that definitely knows what he wants to hear. In the case of outside musicians, like outside session musicians, I barely know what the chords are on a guitar, let alone musical styles. I don't, I don't really know any musical terms. I can't articulate it in words. I can only do it in sounds and playing other people's records and saying, can you do something like that? It's really nice to work with people who know what they want and, and not kind of just flimsy. And... So after working on the last album, I knew what to expect um, working with Noel. I got to the studio and there was just two people there rather than what I thought would be 10 or 20 people. And it was a really relaxed atmosphere and Noel was so easy to work with, but as is Paul. I already knew what harmonies I'd have to do, so I went into the booth and um, beforehand and afterwards we would have lots of chat and banter and funny stories from Noel, which is uh, great fun. It's very charismatic. We've been friends for 17 years, so I've said the odd thing that I thought and, you know, some things, you know, seem to sprout and some things don't. We're doing some track, might have been on the last record, probably What A Life. I was going to get somebody like a professional dance person in to do it and he was saying it would be much better if we try and make a dance record because then it'll be fucking, then it won't be that, it'll be our version of it, you know. And he was right, and it's the same with some of the tracks on this. If I'm trying to do jazz or space jazz or fucking, you know, um, disco, if you get, you know, Nile Rodgers in, it'll sound like Nile Rodgers, you know what I mean? If you're pretending to be someone else, then it sounds a little bit fucked up and weird and a bit wrong. I thought it was good sound advice. It was advice I've adhered to ever since. <laughs> Anything is on the table when I'm writing and recording now, anything. When you're in a stadium rock band, it's stadium rock and you're not going to hold the attention of 80,000 people at Wembley Stadium with intricate arrangements and blah 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 and all that. When you're on your way up, you're kind of, you're eager to please and you're eager to get it done and be fucking huge and I don't know, mate, yeah, no, I just don't care, I just don't care anymore what people say. A song can go anywhere now, you know, anywhere, and I'm, I don't really feel like I've got any inhibitions about jazz or, you know, disco. 
that I would have had maybe 15 years ago. But well, they're just different times in your life. Definitely maybe it was written by a young man, it sounds like it, you know, this, this record was written by, you know, a middle-aged fucking geezer, which sounds like it at all. Riverman, we were all really, really excited when, when I finished it and when it got to the, the saxophone break, it was a case of, shall I actually get a saxophone player? You know, it was just like we phoned this guy up, we played for Primal Scream and down he came and we played in Wish You Were Here and on a few other Pink Floyd things. The, the Wish You Were Here from, by Pink Floyd was one of the reference points we, we talked about when we went in and I think the fact we ended up using baritone on it, sonically it very much takes it you know, into that kind of psych rock avenue. <laughs> When he'd finished and we'd picked the perfect one, it was a real kind of, wow, that's fucking incredible. Then the album became something different. I will be accused of uh, sex crimes, sexual harassment, uh, when the album comes out, but I uh, fucking love it. My missus, for instance, was just like, when it got to the bits, she just said, I fucking hate saxophones. Why do people hate them, though? A lot of fucking great iconic figures in music, you know, like, you know, the, the jazz, the jazzers, you know, all play saxophones, don't they? I think the saxophone has uh, got somewhat of a, uh, a malign sort of reputation that, that stems from what I would say some serious cases, some serious uh, crimes against music committed, you know, in the 80s and early 90s that we, it wasn't used in a great way. And to a certain extent, I'd say the saxophone has been on probation but everyone deserves a second chance. For every Kenny G, there was a John Coltrane and a Charlie Parker, so, you know. No, I think, I think we deserve a second chance, but that way. When you're listening to it, don't think about the guy from Spandau Ballet, right? Don't think of that. Think of some fucking guy smacked out of his fucking head in New Orleans in 19... fucking 63 or something. Think that. Don't think of Through the Barricades or fucking... <laughs> True, please don't think of that. Think of something more druggy than that. The interesting thing with Noel is that he's he's got great taste and he's always playing me very interesting obscure tracks that you know i'm always like wow where did he where did he find that and i really feel that this album he's there's he's incorporated that side of his taste it, or he certainly started to with this record so it's uh, yeah i mean and that and that particularly the right stuff i think that has those elements in it and it was great fun to play as well <laughs> Coming to the end of the sessions for this record, we came up one track short with all the B-sides and all that. It was, it was a long, sprawling kind of eight, nine minute thing. And it had loads of fucking saxophone on it. And it was way out there. I went home one night and listened to a rough mix of it and thought if I, if I edited it down, it would sound more concise and a bit more like a, a song as opposed to like a jam. And it's, it's fantastic. God, it's one of my favourite ever pieces of music. The lyrics, you know, again, you and I got the right stuff. I guess it's a direct conversation between two people. And it was an afterthought and it was going to be a B-side until it came out so great in all its glory. It was like, oh, that's definitely the first track of side two. No fucking way. Playing on the right stuff was great fun actually. It's got a brooding, atmospheric kind of quality to it. It was actually Noel's idea to bring bass clarinet. The closer to the edge I got with my playing, the more he was enjoying it. You know, that I actually wasn't quite in control sometimes, but you know, Noel seemed to get off on that, which was nice. <laughs> You know, 
I couldn't be uh, <laughs> any less spiritual jazz sitting here in front of you today. That's not the first thing you think of when you see a picture of me. Okay, it's like a fucking jazz dude there, man. He's a fucking, hey man, he's a cool cat, man. No, I don't know where it comes from, you know, I don't know. My mate Lawrence actually, when he first heard it, I think he might have used the words finally. He went, finally, fucking hell. I don't know what he meant by that, but. I've been working with Noel for the last, or on his last two solo projects and to the latter part of the um, Oasis days. Um, I started working with Noel on the um, Don't Believe the Truth album for Oasis and then I've worked with him ever since. Good relationship with Noel photography wise, he's, he's got a good idea of, of imagery and then he, he lets me sort of get on with it and um, either location wise or, or with, with ideas and normally we come back with something good. Pictures for the new album began with, with something that Noel came back with. He found some funky little boxes that oscillated and messed around with wavelengths and projectors. He bought a couple off the internet and gave me them to um, go off and play with by feeding music through them. It affected the wavelengths of um, the projections or TV images. It didn't, it didn't take that long. I think we spent an afternoon. And we did about two, two and a half hours of projections. And we've got, we've got lots of different backgrounds and different effects out of them. Listening back to it when it was finished, all the songs are kind of still about the same couple who are still searching for something. I don't know, I don't know why. I'm, I'm kind of in a, in a place of songwriting at the minute where the songs are very direct about a me and a you, or um, a him and a her, or a him and a him, you know, whatever. It's not intentional in any way, but when I listen back to the, the album when it was finished, all the songs are about relationships still. The big difference on this one is there's a lot more guitar solos. On the last record there was one, I can recall. There might have even been two. On this album, I think out of the ten tracks, nine have got guitar solos in them. That wasn't really a conscious thing, was to make more of a guitar record. That's just what the songs dictated on the day, you know. Followed you down to the end of the world to wait outside your I tried to get Johnny Marr to play on the last record. I wanted him to play on What A Life, and he couldn't do it because he was busy doing something. So on this record, I called him and I said, can you come up, I've got this track, can you come and play on it? And he said, uh, he said yeah, 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 okay. Well, I said, oh, I'll, send, I'll send you the, the, the rough mix. And he said, no, 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 I don't want to hear it. I'm just going to come and I'll just kind of react to it on the day. And I was like, fucking hell, that's brave. I said, can I even give you any pointers? And he said, no, I don't want, don't even tell me what it's like. And he, you know, he arrived on the day, with two guitars and a bag of effects pedals, and off it started. And he kind of went, oh, fucking hell, mm. Oh, wow. He said, oh, I didn't know it was going to be like this. I was like, well, I was trying to tell you, you know. I've got to say, man, watching him play the guitar is fucking unbelievable. He's such a, I mean, he's like properly way up there. When you hear it, his guitar bits on it, it's instantly recognisable as him. He was great to be in the studio with that day and just a great like burst of energy and kind of he's always really positive about stuff about everything. What a blast doing it. And um, that could have been the centrepiece of the album. You know, it's such an epic and cinematic. I like The Mighty Eye, uh, that's my favourite track. I saw him write it and he brought it in and I was like, oh that's, that's uh, chord sequence wise a bit different than what he normally does. From working with him as long as I've worked with him there's a format that I recognise and this was like a new thing, you know. He did it and he didn't think it was good enough. I didn't actually agree with him, I thought it was really good, but in retrospect 
the version that we end up with, I think is, I'm glad it was this one and not the one that we did before. I can't be put on the spot and said, right, well, today you're in the studio with, you know, fucking whoever, and we're going to write a song. I can't, I can't do it like that. They've all, they've got to fall out of the sky for me. I mean, the trick is always to be switched on and always to be ready for when, for when it falls out of the sky. Most of the songs that I start to write, I finish off in my head in the most innocuous of places, you know, in a doctor's waiting room, buying toothpaste, fucking, you know, parents' evenings. You know, because you're kind of, you're kind of switched off. <laughs> a terrible thing to say, you're switched off at a parents' evening, but fucking hell, I am. Yeah, if I'm trying to write, I can never write when I'm actually not trying to write at all. You know, I drive my fucking wife bananas. I could be out, you know, be out having something to eat. And be, she'll be like, what are you, what are you doing? You know, I'd be kind of tapping on the table and writing a, writing a song with the knife and the fork. It drives her insane, you know. And I was told the streets were paved with gold and there'd be no time. I think this album is, is different from any of the others he's done, that he's broadened his horizons. He's done it the right way, you know, he's just bit by bit, and bit but this is the broadest one that he's done. I'm really happy for him. I was waiting for this one. And it's braver, and it takes longer. Overall, I think it's, uh, it's got more of a classic record about it. It's never been a conscious thing for me. I really work on what songs I think are the best Stylistically, that doesn't really come into it. If a song is great and it feels like nothing you've done before, then that's that's brilliant. You know, if a song is great and it sounds like a thousand other th songs you've ever written, I don't give a shit about that as long as it's great. You know, I'm not bothered about that. If you put on a brand new pair of shoes, eventually they just mould to the shape of your feet because that's the fucking shape that you are. You know, and I guess your songs or my songs or one's songs, you know. They just end up like that, but I don't, I don't, I, would, I don't really shy away from anything like that. I, if anything, embrace it. <laughs> like the last album was, was to me, was an album, and it was a trip from start to finish. This is like a great TV series, and TV's better than movies, so they tell me these days.